Born a perfect lady in an imperfect society, Judith Martin, AKA Miss Manners, is the pioneer mother of today's civility movement. Whether your quandary involves fish forks or cell phones, a black tie wedding or a backyard barbecue, she can help you navigate the stormy seas of etiquette. Here's an example of why I love Miss Manners. Dear Miss Manners, I'm an average 14 year old girl who has a problem. My mom won't let me wear thong underwear, and it's the kind I want to wear. My friends make fun of me for not wearing that type. I was wondering if you could help me convince my mom and tell her it is all right to wear them. Gentle reader, of all the advice columnists in the world, you chose Miss Manners as the one most likely to support the cause of thong underwear, and you wonder why your mother questions your judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Judith Martin's latest book, Miss Manners Minds Your Business, tackles the always messy workplace with the practical, pertinent, and utterly correct advice necessary to win the job, keep the job, and leave the job with sanity and dignity intact. Please join me in welcoming Judith Martin to the JCCSF. Thank you very much. I just flew in this morning from um, the capital of civility, Washington, DC. <laughs> well, it's a little quiet there now. And it was a little bit noisy last week. But I am not having any of this business about how rude Washington is, um, which is, um, of course, the main topic of people who want to go live there. Um, they complain about us. Now, I'm a native-born Washingtonian, and as you have already noticed, I am exquisitely polite. <laughs> and so who are those people? They are people that the very people who are complaining about send to us. And uh, I would ask why, but I think I understand. They don't want them back in their towns. <laughs> so they send them to us. Um, but uh, that's what is meant by the rude Washington, not us real Washingtonians. Um, and people say, is there anything we can do about it? And the answer is, yes, it's called an election. <laughs> um, I uh, am expected, I think, to grouse about modern manners, and uh, yet I... I'm a defender of American manners. I think American manners are really the best in the world in theory, not necessarily in practice. Um, they, uh, we have spread those ideas around the world, uh, the dignity of labor. You know, We would never say, as the British do, so-and-so is in trade, and isn't that awful. Um, we have the idea of treating everybody equally. I would prefer it if it were equally politely, and it's more likely to be equally rudely, but at least it's equal. Um, and there have been improvements in the last few decades. Um, for example, uh, open bigotry was tolerated, and bigotry is still with us. I'm not Miss Morals. I wish she would work more on that if there is such a person. I'm Miss Manners. But it's always challenged, and that is a big difference. One of the sports we native Washingtonians have uh, uh, is watching politicians self-destruct by not realizing that that change has come about. <laughs> but I thought, OK, I will um, air some complaints about the state of modern manners. I'm not going to call them pet peeves. I don't like that term. I think pets should be amusing and affectionate. And I think people expect me to say that the biggest etiquette problem today is that people use the wrong fork. Um, the silver forks were all melted down for World War I, so what I assume they mean by the wrong fork is 
um, those plastic forks that break when you put them in the meat. But um, it would be nice if people could learn to eat without disgusting others, I admit. And what do you have more practice at in your life than eating? And you'd think people would be able to get it right, but no. <laughs> However, as I say, that is not the chief etiquette problem today. The chief etiquette problem is greed, is unabashed um, begging on the part of people who are far from indigent. And I don't know if you've been targeted about this, but I hear about it all the time, and not just from the people who are targeted. Um, I get it from people who are confident that if they write to me, I will tell them a nice way to practice extortion. <laughs> and uh, they put it in terms of a dream. My dream wedding. Um, I dream of giving a special present to my husband or wife. Uh, my dream of paying off the mortgage or surprising the parents on their anniversary by giving them a fancy trip or, or just a gala evening at an expensive restaurant with their friends. So that's the first dream. The second dream is to get someone else to pay for it. <laughs> and that's what I'm asked about. And a letter from a woman who wanted, said money's very tight, but she'd like to buy her husband a boat. <laughs> and a gentleman who wanted to throw a party at a restaurant and said, um, I can't afford to pay for everybody's dinner, but this is the restaurant I would like, and how do I tell them that they uh, will be paying for themselves and it would be nice if they all chipped in and bought my dinner too. Um, and a child who says, my mother really doesn't need presents anymore, so how do I tell people to give her cash? or um, a, a wedding invitation that somebody showed me that said, we're working on our first million. And guess where it's supposed to come from? <laughs> so with these dreams come the schemes. How can I tell guests that they're expected to pay without appearing to be a cheapskate? <laughs> what are the rules for having a money tree? Um, some wedding guests have not sent anything yet. Uh, how, what's a tactful way of reminding them? <laughs> and what's the polite way to say on the invitation that we would like monetary gifts? You know, I hate to tell them this, but there is no way to avoid looking cheap and greedy while you're shaking people down. <laughs> and I used to wonder, who's going to hand over money on demand like that? Uh, but people do, because they believe it is the correct thing to do. They're blaming etiquette. And I don't even get part of the take. <laughs> it's not necessary uh, to, I don't want to discourage conviviality or generosity, goodness knows, but if you are pressured to buy, sponsor, or contribute to other people's dreams, um, it, it, etiquette does not require you to comply. Uh, the, um, if you feel the sort of affection for people that makes you want to pay their bills, I don't want to stand in your way. <laughs> but just don't think that etiquette has anything to do with it. Um, now, I have another complaint that people don't really bring up as much, but I think they should. And this has to do with a subject that um, America is extremely prudish about. Uh, so squeamish that people will simply not face the facts of life. And uh, heaven, I'm not talking about sex. I mean, heaven knows we could use a little more reticence on that subject. I don't want to guess what you did last night, so don't, don't even tell me. Um, I'm talking about age and its indignities. I happen to be the only person in America who has been, who was born and has been all my life old at heart. Uh, when I was about eight or ten, my father looked at me and he said, you know, I can just picture you as an old lady with a stick and a high-collared blouse tyrannizing over generations of your descendants. And mind you, I was a little girl in pigtails at the time. And I thought about it and I thought, my daddy understands me. <laughs> Everybody else considers it shameful to age, so we have this elaborate hoax to pretend it doesn't happen. 
And uh, if, if you people gre start greeting you by saying, you look great, um, you're getting old because that means, <laughs> that means I see that you haven't had any debilitative diseases more recently. Um, or you haven't changed a bit. A, a friend from high school said that to me the other day. He said, you haven't changed a bit. I said, I was the only white-haired girl in high school. <laughs> and, you know, being addressed as young lady or sweetie or honey or dearie or, or they don't call us girls anymore. That, that's changed. Now they call us you guys. It's not much of an improvement. Um, or if it has to do with personal recollections, then it's people can think it is polite to say, oh, you're not old enough to remember that. And they can't really say it if it's an event in your own life, but um, like your marriage or when your child was born. But then they will say, um, well, you must have been a child bride, or were you 11 when you gave birth? Um, and speaking of children, that's, is that your daughter? Why, I thought it was your sister. Uh, that's your granddaughter? I thought, please. Uh, that sort of thing would drive me to drink, except I know that somebody would say to me, whoa there, young lady, are you old enough to drink? <laughs> this, is, this is all very tedious, but it is uh, supposedly harmless enough. But it's not so harmless when the elderly take it up themselves. Now, I realize that I'm the only elderly person there is. Everybody else is middle-aged. Middle-aged now goes into the 60s, and so apparently the life expectancy is a minimum of 120. <laughs> we all know we were meant to be immortal, and if we die, it was the doctor's fault, or, uh, and everybody will explain to your survivors that it's your fault if you'd taken better care of yourself or had a better mindset, you, you wouldn't have died. Um, if only medical science could bestir itself to find the cure for aging, the cosmetic companies found, have found it. Um, I see uh, products labeled anti-aging, and I thought, uh-oh, if I'm not going to age, what am I going to do? <laughs> but... Um, the, and we're in a loop where um, after middle age, youth comes around again. You know, so, oh, you're 98 years young. Yeah. And the, the phrase older and wiser is only used in connection with misfortune nowadays. But there are serious etiquette uh, consequences to this thing. It has led to the extraordinary phenomenon of the old being rude to the young because the young are trying to be polite to them. Uh, snapping at someone who offers a seat on the bus, or hurling accusations at any child who has been properly taught to address adults and saying, whoa, you make me feel ancient. Uh, and you know, the, the poor child um, not only has been taught that and, and is, uh, it's been put in doubt, but now has another etiquette problem, which is not saying, but you look ancient. <laughs> um, and, well, and the children who are told, oh, you can't call them grandma and grandpa, because they, 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 they say they're too young to be grandparents. You, we've got to call them bu bu Bubbles and Buster. <laughs> You know what, if your ch children have children, you're old enough to be a grandparent. But, so the, the old are snapping at the young for uh, treating them with respect. Uh, and then they wonder why respect is dying out. Um, the, there are people who are sabotaging the parents who are trying to teach their children to show that kind of respect. <clears throat> and, um, uh, devoted parents now put, may put as much effort into helping um, their children as those who never doubted that they were more competent than their children, except, of course, when we need their help to get out of our computer problems. Um, that sort of turned the world upside down as far as respect for the elderly. I now show a lot of respect for a kid who can um, fix my problems. But a lot of well-meant parenting has gone instead into berating others for not teaching manners, uh, berating the television for not having, uh, exhibiting perfect manners, 
Well, it's drama. I mean, even I wouldn't watch television shows about people being polite to one another. You're supposed to have a little conflict in there. Um, it's um, sports figures and movie stars, right? They have the responsibility for teaching manners to the children and not the parents. Um, and it's left us without a system of precedence. Now, it's true that the ladies first system um, became outmoded, at least in the professional world. It's rather charming still in the social world, but, um, and people who despise it forget that it was a great improvement on the system of precedence which preceded it, which was ladies never. Um, but we have to have a system of precedence, uh, and a system based on age would make a lot of sense because with any luck, we'd all get to be, to go first. But that would be acknowledging age. So instead, we have the lack of a system which results in me first and get out of my way. And it's um, led uh, adults to um, adopt patterns of behavior that were appropriate only to children. Um, in this area of food, this includes the infant standard feeding on demand instead of scheduled meal times, and food fussing, which is now a major topic of adult conversation. Old age is not going to be respected until old people regain their own self-respect. Uh, you know, it's a bargain with the devil. If you um, refuse the dignities of age, it's not going to make you young again. It's only going to make you being treated without the dignities. There are a couple of spin-offs of this. Um, one is, which is not direct, but um, uh, not unrelated. One is compulsory informality, casualness. People will brag, well, I'm always casual. And um, in the area of clothes, it has led people to deny that there is any symbolic system about clothing. And everybody reads clothing for symbolism, and yet people all deny that it exists. I just dress for comfort, and I dress to express myself. And then when perfectly innocent kids dress like um, uh, criminals or prostitutes, um, they're very insulted if people think that's what they are. Um, if you really want to know about symbolism in dress and how it works, commit a terrible crime and hire an extremely good lawyer. And the lawyer will tell you how to dress to symbolize to the jury. I love watching rock stars appear in court looking bandbox fresh with haircuts and smiles and all that. And people, young people now, having been told that the casual standard is the only standard, are starved for some kind of formality only they don't know how to do it, as you can um, see from looking at a junior prom. Uh, and why is it that a young woman who has never had on a dress or a skirt in her entire life, when she's getting married, suddenly needs a $6,000 dress <laughs> to wear for two hours, and wants to dress everybody else, the, uh, uh, wants all the bridesmaids to buy $1,000 dresses, and starts getting ideas that, oh, all the guests should be in this color or that, and so on. I get a lot of letters like that. And the other side of the argument is, well, we should judge people by what's inside. Yes, but how do you peek inside of someone you just met? That has not been worked out yet. Uh, another area is names. You remember when, um, less than a generation ago, First names were used uh, for intimates, for friends, um, but they were used also by people who expected to be addressed with titles. Um, a boss would uh, expect to be Mr. So-and-so, usually was Mr., um, but could call the women on the staff by their first names, and African Americans were addressed even in courtroom uh, procedures by their first names. Um, it was an insult, and um, the, uh, it had to be leveled out. It has been leveled out, but again, I hate it when the amateur etiquette people get to work. If I had done this, I would say dignity and titles for everybody, and no, they say for nobody. Uh, so it's more friendly. 
um, even when there's no relationship remotely co uh, connected with friendship. I once went to um, battle with this on the Mayo Clinic that was having doctors, as many doctors do, address their patients by their first names, and yet they were expected to be called doctor. And they said, well, it's friendlier. And I said, well, you know, it really isn't friendly, because among friends, either both of us have our clothes on or both of us have our clothes off, <laughs> but not just one and one. I, I taught my smartphone to stop calling me by my first name. Um, <laughs> It, it used to, it did that, and it and well, when I first got it, um, I'd seen these advertisements. It's that uh, there was an advertisement that ran that uh, you could take your phone, you push the button, and you say it was a man saying, "Tell my wife I'll be late" or something like that. So I pushed the button. I said, "Tell my husband to, to, to pick me up," and, and the the voice said, um, "I don't know who your husband is, and a matter of fact, I don't even know who you are." <laughs> So I realized I had to fill in my name. So I did fill in my name, and the next time it was, hi, Judith. And I thought, oh, no, you don't. You're much, you're much younger than I am. I don't even know you. I wouldn't recognize you on the street. So I was in the Apple store, and I said, I'd like to fix this, so it calls me Mrs. Martin. And the genius looked at me like I was crazy. He said, I don't know how to do that. And I had to figure it out. I had to tell them. And anybody who wants to do it, see me afterwards. I'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> um, the, uh, just as in a system where you have stages of intimacy, and when you um, suddenly can call someone by their first name because you've married them or something, um, it's very nice. And uh, I maintain that just as people um, can say, uh, please, I would be very pleased if you called me Judith. You can also say, I would be very pleased if you would call me Mrs. Martin. Um, why not? It's my name, and uh, you, are, um, you are equally allowed to give the privileges or to withhold them. Um, now, the book I have just written is per, um, showed a new manners uh, problem to me. Um, I was aware of all the problems that come up at workplaces because people write me letters about them. Person in the next cubicle smells, uh, eats disgusting food, talks too loud, um, dresses wrong, and so on and so on. But finally, it occurred to me what the, the overall bigger problem is in the workplace. And I had the advantage here of working with my son, who um, is uh, director of operations at Lyric Opera in Chicago and has had a lot of equally stress-free jobs, like he was publisher of the Washington Monthly, national political magazine at one point, and he worked on health care at the White House at one point. <laughs> So those, you know, no problems come up in any of those fields, certainly not in opera. But, um, I, and he also helped me see the executive point of view because my only job has been as a uh, ink stain wretch. And he said, you're always sympathizing only with the person who's fired. It's not much fun to fire people either. You have to take up management. But anyway, what we realized, the two of us, is that People have, it isn't just the rudeness problem, people have switched manners. So they use social manners at work and business manners in their private lives. So if you want to hire someone for a job, um, you ask them about their hopes and dreams and their background, and you might take them even out for a nice lunch and get to know them a bit. Um, however, if you would like to um, have a romantic partner, you take out a classified ad. At most, you give them a cup of coffee and snap judgment, and you really want to know how much money they make. Um, I trace a lot of this confusion to some of America's um, sweetest and most disastrous ideas. Um, one of them, which is rather an old one, um, is ladylike behavior. And 
when women of my generation entered the workforce, which is generally now referred to as when women started to work, well, women started to work in the beginning of time. Poor women have always worked. They're really talking about uh, women rising a little bit above that. Um, they, we were brought up that there's only one standard of manners. You're either a lady or you're not. And we all know what that means. Uh, whereas a man could be a officer and a gentleman, or a gentleman and a scholar, and uh, he was supposed to have the same gentlemanly-like rules that ladies uh, had for ladylike rules, but not to behave exactly the same in the drawing room as he did on the battlefield, or even in the library. There were two sets of manners, and women went into the workforce, and there's a trace of this left, um, with, the, uh, with the social manners. You don't talk about money. You don't brag. And these are not ways to get ahead on the job, where it is perfectly proper to do these things. I know I got very angry at the Washington Post once where, I'd, where I said, I haven't had a raise in 20 years. I was angry about something else or I wouldn't have said that. And um, Ben Bradley was the editor, said, you haven't asked for one. He said, the men come in here all the time. Um, and not claiming credit for your work. It's bragging when it's uh, in social life. It's necessary in, um, in business life. And another really disastrous idea that started right here in California, although it does show up uh, every few hundred years in other places, is that if you got to know somebody really well, you would love that person. And we would all get along and be friends if only we took down all the barriers and got to know one another. Um, I find this rather puzzling. I mean, whom do you know more intimately than the person you're divorcing? <laughs> it didn't really, really work. And, it, and yet, there are, it's still in the workplace that building a team, we should all be friends. And so there are all these, these fake friends um, in the workplace. And, <clears throat> and it's taking up people's time um, and, you, and, and money. I mean, are you contributing to the Temps engagement party present? Uh, and by the way, uh, I see from my letters that people agonize um, over what to get their coworkers as presents. And Secret Santa, which when I was in college, we thought we were too sophisticated for, but it's all over the workplace. What do I get? Whereas for their relatives, what they ask me is, how much is the check for my nephew getting married? What's the going rate for um, my sister-in-law graduating or getting a PhD and so on? So they're paying their friends and relatives, but getting presents for their um, colleagues. It's all part of this reversal. And what has disappeared then is, uh, or disappeared from the workplace, is professional manners, where you didn't have to love the person who worked next to you. You had to work cooperatively and cheerfully with that person. Um, if anybody's reminiscent, uh, re reminded by this of what I said when I first came in about Washington civility, um, it's not an accident. Um, but um, the professional manners, as I say, are used socially. Um, and in the workplace, people often ask me, oh, do, can, how do I get out of going to this, where they're having a birthday party for someone I don't really know them, and, and so on. And I say, have you ever thought of saying I have work to do? <laughs> That's what you tell your relatives when you, at the last minute, don't go to their weddings or their dinner parties. You say, well, I've got work. But nobody ever says that when they're at work, oddly enough. <laughs> um, and then another I th of these bad ideas, I think, is uh, that it comes from, which again is uh, well meant, is the child rearing of today. The tech, um, people, the advice that pe parents give their children is, be yourself. What does that mean? Who would you be if you didn't want to be yourself? Um, it's a very odd instruction. And um, I notice that when people talk about being themselves, like, oh, I just want to be myself at home, they mean their worst self. They mean, I'm going to behave disgustingly. And uh, nobody can stop me because it's the real me. 
perhaps. But we all have multiple selves, and the person who behaves the same in a job interview as when out uh, at a beer bash is going to be in trouble. Um, and the young people are not being told that. Um, they are saying, be yourself. And so, OK, fine. And come in, and you put your feet up, and you address the interviewer by the first name, and you start talking about your romantic problems. Um, it's, there are contexts, and uh, we, that is now considered being false to oneself to be different in one place than another. So here we are, my son and I. Um, I uh, misunderstood the part about take your children to work, and I thought it was put your children to work. So, <laughs> so um, I wrote a wedding book with my daughter who, um, when she was getting married and reading all the wedding porn, and there's a lot of porn put out for, uh, they, they tell you all these things you have to do, and most of them hideously vulgar and incorrect, and they use the name etiquette to describe them. And then they know that people can't afford it, so they tell you how to shake down your wedding guests and your family in order to um, do it. But anyway, I wrote this book with her, called Miss Manners' Guide to a Surprisingly Dignified Wedding. And this book um, with my son, uh, with the title that is in violation of etiquette's directive to mind your own business. Uh, and if the system were working, we wouldn't interfere. But it's not, because the, um, the letters that I get, and I get, you know, 50 or 60 emails a day, and a lot of them have to do with work problems. Uh, people are not happy. Um, and they uh, have bought into a kind of phoniness, um, not only that and Americans are supposed to de despise phoniness. I mean, for anything, we're supposed to be genuine. Um, not only the phoniness of pretending that your coworkers are your friends, but since there are no titles, pretending there is no hierarchy. Um, and that it's not really a workplace because we can play video games and, and have little parties and things. Um, and um, as I say, it is, it is not working because people are not happy with it. And inevitably, when it comes to an end, there is a tragedy. And the tragedy is worse if you're fired, of course. Um, and then nobody will look you in the eye because they think it's catching. Um, or if they talk to you after you're fired, they tell you how much work, more work they have to do because they have to do yours as well and you're supposed to sympathize. Um, but even people who have had long, uh, successful careers, when they retire, um, they have not bothered to make friends because they had all these fake friends. And I first noticed this. I used to, for my sins, cover embassy social life in Washington years ago. And we called it the garbage run, because it was a lot of food. Um, and um, every once in a while, an ambassador uh, or another high-ranking official would say, who is retiring would decide to stay in Washington. They say, we have so many friends here. And then, not long after, it was, our friends have deserted us. Well, they didn't have any friends. They had a very posh social life, sponsored, very luxurious, sponsored by governments for the purpose of bringing people together who had various uh, aspects of power. And when they retired, they no longer had that, so they were no longer part of that scene. But this has now trickled down to everywhere because, uh, as you know, work has become a 24-hour job. There's, if you're not actually there, there's the email. Um, there's the texting, there's the checking in from wherever you are on vacation, at home, or whatever you're doing. And people have bought into this. Uh, obviously, they want jobs and they want to make money. I'm trying also to reach the people who make these decisions. And I think in the end, it's worse because you get a lot of disgruntled people uh, who are not happy with their lives because they really don't have lives. They just have working lives. Um, and they're constantly being disillusioned when their pals turn out to be rivals um, or bosses. 
And um, at the same time, in what there is of social life, where how do you do has been replaced by what do you do, um, there is this ranking. And uh, apparently nobody feels confident enough of uh, the exaltedness of the position they hold um, to uh, relax about this. So everybody has to advertise themselves, write ads for themselves on the social media and tell you how wonderful they are. Social media, I love it, killed the meaning of the word friend, and now it's killing the meaning of the word social. Your social life, mostly virtual, is where you troll for admiration and advantages nowadays. Well, and uh, by the way, my son and I are far from minimizing the difficulties that people have with this kind of setup. Uh, both of us um, uh, had around-the-clock jobs uh, when we had small, or he has small children. Um, he has a two-year-old and a working wife, and we know how difficult this is. And when he and his sister were growing up, um, I always had a full-time job. Nobody has sufficient time for work and family. And we're still operating on the 19th century Industrial Revolution system of the division of spheres between men and women. That the man, all the man has to do is earn the money. The woman has to run the household, run civic life, philanthropy, run their social life, and everything else. And now that she has to make money too, that sphere is pretty much deserted. And it's hard on everybody. And systematic changes are needed. Um, and they're mighty slow in coming. So in the meantime, we're offering this book uh, as a guide to the principles and the day-to-day -day practices and how to deal with the smelly person in the next cubicle of coping with this ghastly situation, at least unhampered by the phony assumptions and the false obligations that are making things worse. And that way, our hope is that you will find time to listen to the hopes and dreams of your family and friends and not be embarrassed to ask for more money. Thank you. <laughs>So there's plenty of time to questions. I'm going to ask you to just put your hand up if you have a question for Ms. Manners, and we'll get to you. I neglected to say, please pass the email cards that you filled out to your right, and we'll pick them up, and you will be eligible to win free tickets to a future program, and ushers will collect them. So put your hand up if you have a question, and I'm coming to you. Could we bring the house lights up a little more so I can see people? Just a little more. Thank you. Hi, I'm, my name is Simone Carre, and I'm asking if you're going, she's, she where are the you? Light. Oh, I'm sorry, are the lights, is it okay? Yeah, yeah. well, oh. a little lighter, yeah. Could you yes, make it I'm a little sorry. lighter? Jax, thanks. Great, is that better? Yes. Okay. Oh, thanks. My name is Simone Carre, and I wanted to ask you if you're ever gonna write a book on business travel or etiquette for travel, something along those lines? Um, that's an interesting question, because I, I spend a lot of time in Venice. I once wrote a book about Venice. Um, and the manners are slightly different. Um, they're very charming. They're very polite people. Uh, and they explain that they're polite people because they can't get in the car and go off after they have an altercation like you Americans can. We keep seeing people in the street. We're all walking. Um, but th it varies, and I've looked at a lot. There are a lot of books like that, and I've looked at them, and I, I keep finding mistakes. Um, and this is not, this is really out of my own experience. My father was with the UN, we lived abroad in various places, and I loved to travel. And I sympathize with the people who made those mistakes because uh, you have to really know a culture very well in order to know what the nuances of etiquette are. And there are a few broad things that you uh, uh, should study before you go someplace, just as you should um, learn. Um, bits of the language. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to really get inside and get the nuances. And I, I have them for Italy, I have them for America, a little bit for other places I've, I've lived, but uh, I can't do a comprehensive book on that. 
The next question over here to your right. My dear Mrs. Martin, it is a pleasure finally seeing you after Thank all you. the years I have read your books. I, for one, believe that civility perhaps might have a chance to make the world more, not only pleasant, but peaceful. And I lament when I answer the telephone at home and someone blurts out my given name or sending an invitation with an RSVP and being completely ignored. I have come to the conclusion that most people are not reading you and certainly what, you, <laughs> certainly what used to be the sacred temple of manners, the home, is long gone. Therefore, as you once said, why don't you tell in your sweet little village, namely Washington, that these things should be taught at school? Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, and of course, I agree with you, except on the idea of teaching it in school. Um, school teachers are trying to teach children to read and write, to um, uh, know some history, to know some mathematics, to know some geography, uh, to put the burden on them and not on the parents, uh, I think is unfair. Now, a schoolroom should have its rules, um, and that is one way of teaching manners. Um, I, uh, I always envy judges who can make absolute etiquette rules and haul you off to jail if you disobey them. <laughs> and teachers have a little bit of authority like that. But it is the parents who need to do that because it is a constant job. And what we have now, and I was involved in my children's schools very much, and uh, it isn't just the underprivileged parents and overwrought parents who are not doing this job. A lot of it is the very privileged parents who do not want to say no to their children, who do not cooperate with the teachers because if the child is in trouble, they act as the child's lawyer to, instead of the teacher's uh, uh, colleague. And uh, yes, teachers, Bless their hearts, they go into the profession because they care. Heaven knows it's not for the money. And uh, I would not put that burden on them other than to run a classroom where rules are observed. But in this, uh, my children's school, which I also went to, is a private school. And in Washington, the public schools are not as good as they can, but should be. And people were desperate to get their children into private school at any cost because your child could, frankly, end up dead, uh, not just ignorant, in, in the public school system at one time. Um, and they would uh, school their little toddlers to read or to do all kinds of things. And we said, we'll teach them to read. We're a school. Um, teach them some manners. And then people would sneer and they'd say, well, teach a three-year-old manners? Yes, you teach them to sit down and be quiet for at least a few minutes. Uh, you teach them you don't hit people you disagree with. A few, you know, three-year-old manners. And then you teach them four-year-old manners and so on. So I'm totally with you. I didn't mean to jump on you over that one thing. But yes, manners must be taught to the young. It is so unfair to them not to teach them. When I started doing this, I thought I would be writing for a few old cranks like myself. And not true. It's mostly questions are for young people. Those same young people whose only instruction from their parents was to be themselves. Um, and they don't know how to handle different situations. Um, because it, as I always say it's like throwing a child out on a soccer field and saying, well, there aren't any rules. Just do your best. You know, be yourself. You're going to get killed. <laughs> So, but I'm with you entirely, and thank you for your kind words. The next question's here. Hi, Ms. Manners. I'm, I'm Michael, and I've got a question about hats. Where I'm are over you? Here. Oh, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so, I like wearing hats. When can I put them on? When do I need to take them off? And is a baseball hat any different than like this kind of a hat? Um, uh, well, it, it's the rules were very strict about gentlemen and hats, and they sort of got forgotten because a whole generation that's now. Uh, 
middle-aged or more, uh, didn't want to wear hats. Men didn't want to wear hats because their fathers wore hats, and they didn't want to look old. And now hats are, are coming back, and as you say, the baseball cap is everywhere. Uh, the, the rule is that a gentleman mo removes his hat indoors. Um, in, I'm sorry to keep coming back to Venice, but uh, that's my other venue, and I'll be there in three weeks. Um, the, there were some American tourists who were attacked in St. Mark's Basilica because they had, were wearing baseball caps, and the, the uh, Italians who atta young Italians who attacked them interpreted that as sneering at their religion. Uh, because it's an arbitrary thing, and women could keep their hats on. Uh, and, well, for that matter, all of etiquette is arbitrary. Manners, the principles, are eternal and the same. But, as you know, a man takes off his hat in a church, but he puts on a hat in a synagogue. And the uh, intent is to show respect, so it's the same. But uh, if you violate it, you offend people. And if everybody in the world had forgotten that a gentleman is supposed to take his hat off, you could leave it on. But they haven't. <laughs> Next question in the middle up here. Yes. Um, today, I checked in Where are for... You? I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> checked in to a doctor appointment routine. Um, I have two names, Marsha Rosenbaum. And... I'm being called Miss Marcia. Uh, this happens to me all the time, and it drives me nuts. What is up with that? Well, in the South, that would be considered um, what you should call someone who is um, close but not uh, total intimate, or what you could teach your children to call it close family friends. But I don't think that that's what is intended around here. They're trying to compromise. They probably run into the anger of some people who didn't like being called by their first names. As I said earlier, I think you can say very nicely how you would like to be called. And you should do that. Because, again, they it's probably by people who think it's flattering to you. And it's not. The next question is here to your left. Yeah. Briefly with thanks. Uh, parenthetically, I do think that the middle age extends well into the 60s. Uh, but well, I envy uh, you. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm troubled personally with my conclusion that the word respect, the idea of respect, is uncomfortably close to the idea of fear, and I'm looking for a different, more appropriate word. Civility strikes me as attractive. Do you know of a website that has to do with a civility movement? Uh, no, not particularly. <laughs> I, um, but I want to quarrel with your um, uh, definition of respect. Uh, we treat people we admire with respect. Um, I, Mr. Wallenberg was a great uh, person who was respected all over the world for what he did. Uh, it's not just fear, it's admiration, too. And some of it is just because we recognize a certain hierarchy, and part of it has to do with age. And people who say, well, why should I respect grandma the way she behaves? Uh, because she's your grandmother, that's why. <laughs> um, so uh, please don't put down respect, but I'm all for civility. The next question over here on your right, over the back. What's the best way to say I'm hosting an event, but I would not like gifts? That is such a sympathetic problem. I get it all the time. And I have so many questions from people who say, I'm hosting, and how do I tell people they have to pay for themselves, and I do want gifts, that I... <laughs> That I love the people who feel this way, but and I'm very sorry to have to say you're not supposed to be thinking even about getting presents. Um, and if you say I don't want them, here's what happens: I get letters from people who say, "Does that mean they want cash?" <laughs> or, "Well, I suppose I should bring it anyway." 
and it doesn't do any good, so you might as well not do it. But you are not supposed to be thinking of that. If you um, want to get around it on a particular occasion, if you want to have a party on your birthday, for instance, here's how you do it. You just have a party. And then when you're there, you say, I'm so glad you all came. It's, it's my birthday, and I wanted to be with you. And they'll all say, why didn't you tell us we would have brought you something? But that's the way they don't have to. <laughs> the next question's up here to your left. Mrs. Martin, I'm so happy to be here. And I have a question about whether I did the correct thing. About five years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., uh, and it was uh, the inauguration. And I was driving in a car with my husband, and I saw you walking down the street. <laughs> and I said to my husband, oh my god, it's Judith Martin. Stop the car. <laughs> and my husband stopped the car, and he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I, I, I think I'm going to run down the street after her and tell her how much I love her work. And, how wonderful she looks. And, um, and I said, do you think that would be weird? And he said, well, what do you think Miss Manners would say you should do? <laughs> well, Miss Manners does not think it would be weird at all. Oh. <laughs> if you remember, it was a bitterly cold day. Yes. And we all had to walk uh, uh, for hours and hours because um, the transportation was all choked up and everything. And on that bitterly cold day, it would have warmed my heart. Oh, that's so nice. Well, we did, we tried, I, I erred on the side of caution. I said, well, I think she would think we should keep driving. So I did. So I'm so glad I finally got to ask you, and I will run home and tell my husband. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the next questions uh, up here to your right, near the balcony. Hello. Um, I have a great fear of the possibility that they're somehow going to change the rules or the laws so that everybody will be able to talk on cell phones on planes. What do you think about that? And if it happens, what do you do to discourage the persons next to you from talking on their phones? Uh, the airlines, I mean, it probably will happen, yes. And uh, the airlines, in fact, some planes already have, uh, they had phones built in that for $1,000 a minute you can <laughs> say goodbye to the person you just said goodbye to on the ground. Um, but uh, they're going to end up probably unbearably slowly doing what they did with the smoking situation which was first everybody could smoke all over the planes, and then they had smoking sections where the smoke was all in the back and it wafted up to the front. <laughs> um, and then finally it got banned altogether. Uh, whether they'll ever get to the ban thing, I don't know. But the trains uh, do this now. They have a quiet car and where you're not allowed to use your cell phone. Uh, and uh, I don't know how they'll work it out on planes, but they... I just came in on a plane this morning, and I've concluded for the millionth time that they're really not interested in your comfort. <laughs> so I don't have much faith in it. The next question's up here again to your left. <clears throat> okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, one of the things that just drives me nuts is in a restaurant where you get a family that sits down with younger children, and they think they're home. And the little kid bangs the spoon on the table for 20 minutes, and the mother just sits there because the child does it at home. And they look at you like, well, it's a child. What do you expect? And God forbid you go over and say, you know, that's really irritating me. I came to have a nice dinner, not to listen to your children scream at the top of their lungs, bang the table. And if you do that, you could get shot. So how do you, how do you approach that situation and I'm not talking about a coffee shop. I'm talking about a fine dining restaurant where children are allowed to run up and down the aisles. Waiters are tripping over them. They're screaming. And you can't even hear your own self talk because of the noise around you. And I'm, I'm horrified by the fact that the children do this at home. What a home life these people must have. <laughs> Um, direct confrontation is not a good idea, and not only because you're going to get shot, which you probably are. Um, <laughs> you go to the restaurateur, and you say, I like this restaurant very much, but I, it, I'm, it's, 
unbearable, and I'm, uh, I, I'm not having a nice dinner here. And either he finds you a place to go, or he kidnaps the child, or you never go there again. Um, but direct confrontation is really a bad idea. Even I don't go around scolding people. <laughs> it's rude. The next question's here in the middle. Yes, Mrs. Manners, it's an honor to be here tonight with you. Thank you. And I just want to tell you, I have twin boys, and they're 14, and they're constantly on their phones. And when we go out to dinner with a group of family, I always tell them, give me your phones, because I think <laughs> you're in a restaurant. This is a time to communicate with family member and friends. And then I always have someone intervening and saying, oh, let them be, you know, they're not bothering anyone, and, <laughs> and you're so strict, and this and that, and, and I just hate that someone's putting me in that position, first of all, in front of my kids, and challenging me with my choices, and I have my kids give me their phones anyway. <laughs> Good so. for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are a lot of people who try to sabotage any child rearing that they see. Uh, <laughs> The explanation to your children and to these people who are interfering is, I feel sorry for them too. They have a terrible mother who's very strict, but that's the only mother they have, and those are the rules. The next question over here up to your right. When I was growing up in Provo, Utah, we had a very clear rule in my family, which is no singing at the table. And I assumed that this was a rule of universal application. And then I found, uh, talking to friends from time to time, that they, not only had they never heard this rule, they thought it was totally weird. And one friend of mine just said she thought it was bad luck. <laughs> bad luck not to sing? What were they singing? Nobody was singing. The rule was against it. What do they want to sing that brings good luck? Um, oh, never I have mind. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the people have enough trouble not talking with their mouths full. How are they going to sing with their mouths full? Um, it's a terrible idea, and um, your parents were right, and I hope you preserve that. Thank you. Here's a question in the front. Hi. Uh, it's uh, great to finally uh, see you in person. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah, it was very uh, enlightening. And, um, but I do have a, a minor quibble um, as, uh, about the casual dress thing, as you might imagine. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing a message t-shirt to a Judith Martin talk, so yeah. Um, but, it, but it's a very, I will in my defense say that the colors are very similar, and so it's a very subtle. Message t shirt. The cut is similar too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't have a cameo though. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, well, y your point about the clothing was that you, you can't uh, know someone uh, upon first meeting them, so you have to have a code to judge them by. What about the option of suspending judgment, or at least until they open their mouth and say a few words and judge them by that? <laughs> uh, and also, I, maybe I didn't make clear, context is important. Uh, for, I mean, I'm not against casual dressing. I'm against casual dressing on formal occasions uh, or professional occasions. Uh, so I'm nothing against your very handsome T-shirt, except it would look better with a cameo. But um, <laughs> uh, yes, you judge people by many things. Before I was in this rather bizarre profession. I was a, a film and drama critic. And uh, how do you judge drama? Uh, costume, gesture, speech, all of those things. And yes, uh, I'm not saying clothes are the most important thing. But if uh, someone, this did not happen, but if someone had been sitting shirtless next to me in the air, at the airplane, I don't think I would have drawn him out to find out what kind of person he was. I would have asked for another seat. You know? The next question over here to your right, near the balcony. Yes. Good evening, Ms. Manners. Good evening. Um, I entertain a lot, and there's something that I've noticed is sort of like a new fad, and it's driving me crazy, and that's when dinner guests sort of spontaneously decide when to start clearing the dishes. They, they not only clear them, but they <laughs> scrape them at the table. And, and I've actually had a situations where I say, oh, no, 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 please, I'll, I'll take care of that in just a few minutes. And they persist. And even trying to take plates where the people are still eating. 
and, and, they, and then I say, no, really, there's no place in the kitchen. I'll take care of it. And they still persist. So I need some way to act, actually just stop them dead in their tracks. Tell me when you're giving a dinner party, I'm going to come over and I'm going to say, sit down. <laughs> uh, you have to be firm with them. And, uh, you know, they, they, I think you're, you're putting it very charmingly and very nicely, and I think they think you don't mean it. So you have to tell them you mean it. It's, it's a, um, there's very little, if you may have noticed, reciprocation to people who entertain. And so there has grown up this idea that, well, they'll, they'll do a little something while they're there, or they'll bring a dish or something, and then they don't have to invite you back. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, the case there, but these habits have uh, become ingrained, and you have to be firm with them. And uh, you are the host. You are in charge. Pretend you're the judge in the courtroom. <laughs> Nicely. <laughs> Here's a question here down in the front to your right. Hello, Miss Manners. Uh, Hello. First of all, I wanted to point out my shirt. I read your bit about red ink today in your column, so I'm <laughs> celebrating that by wearing my favorite color red. Uh, anyway, my question involves the fact that professionally I work with young adults 18 to 22 with very special needs. And one of the patterns there in our society now is such individuals are becoming ever, ever more present in our society. They're not so sequestered as they once were. In the schools, they're often mainstreamed in classes. I function as what's known as a paraprofessional and aid directly to a student. I might sit in a high school class with that student and um, simplify assignments for them, things like this. Anyway, um, right now I'm working with the 18 to 22 age group. And one of the things that we struggle with is what is the best way to help our students and help people around them understand things like stimming. For instance, I have a student who rubs his head like this all on a regular basis. He doesn't stop. And we try to get him to put his hands down, but it's natural for him to do that. What is the best way to deal with the awkward social situations where people are hostile to seeing these kinds of things? Um, I even hate to say this, even have people tell me who are educated people, uh, why didn't they kill them? And, yeah, that, that's not an uncommon Really? Sentiment. It's not uncommon, my God. Um, you're not going to be able to retrain everybody. And part of the idea of mainstreaming is that the idea that they get used to it, that it's not something weird that they've never seen before. And um, of course, you are giving these uh, young people social training, I'm assuming, which they need above all. My, my son-in-law has done the same kind of work. And uh, he said, it's appalling that people, they can get to the age of 20 without having been given any guidance in social behavior, which is extremely important. Now, they may still not blend in perfectly. And I think a, a, a lecture to a class and so it would not be out of line. But you're going to have to teach them also to deal with that because they're going to encounter it all their lives and it's a terrible thing. Uh, but um, people do react that way and uh, the whole mainstreaming movement is trying to stop that. Uh, thank you so much. I want to let you know that the winners of tickets to upcoming events are Larry Bai and Karen Shine. Please see me afterwards. Thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Come and see us and get a book. Thanks most of all to Mrs. Martin, <laughs> Judith Martin, Miss Manor. Thank you.